Thank you very much. Buenos dias, bonjour, and guten tag. Those are the three languages that uh, are in the room and that I know. <laughs> but I will not speak German, which is my mother tongue. I stick to English. So no worries for the translators. Um, thank you very much for the kind introduction, and thank you very much for inviting me here. It's a fabulous opportunity to talk to s Spanish uh, scientists, and I am also happy to see so many young people here at the university. We really need to generate a younger generation getting involved in these issues. Um, being number, I don't know what, six or five or seven now in the, in the speaking list, you've heard a lot, meanwhile, about GMOs and the issues, so uh, I hope I, I skip over or I'm not repeating too much of it. But I will recap a little bit. Okay, and I need to learn how to push the right buttons here as well. You've heard before that there is um, two types of GM crops out there, and basically. And you do hear like different messages. Uh, one message could be that the whole world is planted to GMOs already, and it's a lost case if you, if you try to raise a debate about it. It's, it's, it's a done deal. And then there is others who say, no, it is not, and sort of look through the details and cut through the promotion and, and the advertisement in trying to find out what is, what is uh, the real case. So we are dealing with two trades, basically. It is herbicide resistance and insect resistance. You've heard of that before. Four. The resistance against herbicides is based largely on glyphosate or Roundup resistance, with the active ingredient being glyphosate. And the other trait is a resistance against insects. All of them that are out there are based on Bacillus thuringiensis, a bacteria typically occurring in the soil where we took the genes out that code for potent bioactive insecticidal compounds and only those, those genes, that DNA that codes for the, for the expression of that insecticide has been transformed and um, modified into GM crops. And those crops are at, right now it's cotton and corn uh, we don't have yet BT oilseed rape out there, and it's just now that a BT soybean uh, is being introduced uh, for marketing by Monsanto. But up to now, soybean has been only out there as a herbicide-resistant uh, varieties. Now, we've been promised 20 or 25 years ago that we would be uh, at a stage these days where we would have custom-tailored um, plans that would be tailored to the specific needs of farmers, to specific environments, and would meet all kinds of needs. Well, that hasn't turned out at all. We're still 20, over 20 years now, and I'm in that business since 1990, so I'm following it personally since, since that time. Um, we haven't gotten beyond the first generation. All right, this is what we started with 20, 22 years ago and more with the experiments. And this is where we still are. It is BT and it is herbicide resistance. And the innovation we're seeing at this time is the combination of these two, all right, which is called the stack genes. And that combination, by the way, is reached through conventional breeding. So they are breeding the single parents or the double parents of them and are breeding them to stack those genes upon or into one cultivar. That's conventional breeding. It's not transfer, uh, any, any additional transformations anymore. I find this noteworthy to keep in mind when it comes to sort of cutting through the advertisement and understanding what are we really having in the world. So there is clearly a bottleneck, and it's been in, uh, recognized by the industries, and there's different analysis why there is this bottleneck. We can discuss this later if you wish, but there is a bottleneck. And it is not due to regulations because most of the stuff is being introduced in the US and there is a very lax regulation that keeps anything from being introduced. So there's, that's a more complex story. Now this is um, a graph that we put together uh, in the so-called ISTAT, that's the International Assessment of Agricultural Science and Technology for Development. It was a big UN report on agricultural science, knowledge, and technology for development so in the hunger context. Biotechnology was one part where we looked at, and we really tried to understand, so where do we stand with regard to, to biotech crops being in production, where is it produced, and how much of the total production in agriculture is it? So these are the data of this report. Most of it is basically grown in North and South America. And of that total 
and it is by no means the majority of the crops there. It is the majority of the soybeans and of the maize in the US, but they do grow other stuff as well, and that is not GM. So the orange is the GM production, and the purple one is the regular, the total production of agriculture. And you see that out, outside of the, these four countries, in essence, the part and the proportion of GM production is really small. So there's no way, uh, by no means, it is like growing everywhere and all the time and in all countries. It is really reduced in essence, 80, 90% is grown in four to six plant, uh, countries, and that's been the case ever since we introduced the technology. And another graph from that ISTAT report is this. So that is the conventional agriculture of total land with total agricultural production, and that is the share of, uh, of GM cultivation. This was obviously 2006 it ended, we, we'd be up here by now because the report was released in 2008. Um, for Europe, uh, just to remind us, the, the biggest growing country is Spain, and that's the single only country that grows uh, uh, GM crops at, at a significant extent. We have some production in Romania, in Slovakia, and Czech Republic, but those are in the hundreds uh, uh, of hectare or a few thousands of hectare nowhere near what, what is being grown in Spain. So Spain is the single most uh, largest, or really the GM producing country on a commercial scale, because much of what's grown here is also under special permits. They're grown under uh, releases, permit releases for temporary time in certain areas, so it's not really up to the commercial level yet. Um, these numbers all, by the way, are reliant on industry data, okay? That is one, one big uh, problem we have in this field. Uh, there is only the industry has a, a group called the IAAAS, and that data is what's being fed to them from the industry. So there's no way that we can verify this independently on a global scale. Countries usually have statistics about production, but they run these statistics very differently, and so that makes it really difficult to compare it between the countries, what is being registered, what not. They have different rules for registration and so on. So it's very difficult to keep uh, an oversight and monitor what is really produced in those countries. There's no independent verification of that. Most of the data is ex exclusively uh, industry data. So also this is basically industry data. All right, so we have in, in Europe, we have eight countries that have a ban installed either on a particular crop, which is really only Monet 10, because that's the only one that's EU-wide uh, released. And we have either GM bans, like in Switzerland, where you can't grow whatever might come along, or you have specific bans, like in Germany and in France, where it is uh, tailored to uh, Monet 10 maize, specifically. But since it is only the only one um, uh, registered right now EU-wide, it amounts to basically a GM moratorium. And we have one other plant that has been uh, um, registered for commercial production. I believe it was 2009 or 10. That was the starch altered Amflora potato. That potato was grown for one year and then basically withdrawn from the market. It is grown on a few hectares for uh, illustrative examples, at least in Germany that was, and that, that has even been destroyed this summer. So Amflora potato is really not, not grown on any significant level, which leaves us still with Monet 10 being the single one uh, GM crop that's grown in, in Europe. All right, so that just that um, we are on the same page when it comes to what is grown and, and how much is out there. Well, for risk assessment and environmental risk assessment, so I'm shifting gears a bit, that's my job. And I try to introduce you to the regulations very briefly. There is regulations out there, there's EU regulation, there's international regulation on, on risk assessment. This is the international so-called Cartagena Protocol on Biosafety, that's an, a, a coming out of the CBD, the Convention on Biological Diversity, that is a UN convention. And by now we have uh, over 160 signatory countries, as far as I know. And these countries meet on a fairly regular basis to implement the provisions put forward in that protocol. And it is legally binding to those signatory countries. So there's 160 plus countries who are legally bound to the provisions put forward. And when it comes to risk assessment, this is basically some of the rough 
pillars that it gives out. It says the environmental risk assessment has to be case by case, has to be on considering the intended use and in consideration or in context of the receiving environment wherein you introduce your crop. The European Union has, a, has also its own legislation. So the, the Cartagena Protocol really is like the minimum consensus that any of these UN conventions constitute the minimum common denominator that all of these nations could find. So this is the lowest denominator. Countries have to can go above it, but they cannot go below it who've signed it. Okay? So the EU has gone a bit above it, not much so, but a little bit in terms of explaining a bit more what they consider adverse effects. This is not spelled out in the Cartagena Protocol, but it is spelled out a bit more in the European Directive 2010, uh, 2001-18. And it says, we have also be case specific, identify and evaluate potential adverse effects that could be either direct or indirect, immediate or delayed or cumulative over time. Okay, that's important that you understand that these are all the things you should be considering in your risk assessment, which you do before you give a commercial approval uh, for, for growing them on a larger scale. Now, when you look into this, this is the framework where it is sort of embedded in. It starts out with the hazard identification. It also identifies here the causes of adverse effects and formulates problems, all right? This is a very important step. I will come back to that again. And then basically you have two more um, categories. One is to understand the potential effects, which is usually based on, on trials and experiments, and to understand the exposure, which will give you an estimation of the likelihood of this adverse effect, shall there be one, might occur. So it is always this classic risk formula of the likelihood of some event to occur. So you might be able to identify an effect, but you might say, okay, the likelihood that this effect occurs is minimal, so the overall risk, which is the last step of a sense of strict to environmental risk assessment, might be low. You might have a small effect, but a large likelihood that it can happen, and then you will come to another kind of risk characterization and judgment. All right? So this is just in principle that you understand how the risk assessments are being done. You understand the exposure, and you try to understand the potential adverse effects through testing. We will come back to that. Now, this is the Cartagena Protocol, um, the, the roadmap for environmental risk assessment under the Cartagena Protocol. Don't worry, because this is where you, in essence, find the one I just showed you again, all right? So in essence, they are pretty similar Again, here you have a, a step where you identify, basically you do your homework, you try to understand what do I know about the organism, what do I know about the receiving environment, what kinds of risk scenarios could I foresee, what kinds of tests would I like to see and get as a regulator, this is always from a perspective of a regulator, in order to be able to estimate my effect, potential adverse effect, and to understand how likely that adverse effect might occur. Okay. So you have, in essence, it's always the same kind of formula you find in different sort of wordings, but that's the gist of it. And that is where we will go and, and talk about. So far, so good. There is little controversy about this overall principle and this overall framework. We don't have a, a major disagreement that these are the basic components like exposure assessment, ad, ad, adverse effect determination, and overall risk characterization, and a, and a first step of identifying your potential adverse effects. That's fairly non-controversial. Where the controversy comes in really is how to do it. And that becomes very quickly very tricky because that's where you can sort of go different ways and come up with different types of data that you have heard from our previous speakers are so controversial. So in essence, the controversy is really about a narrow interpretation of those provisions that we agree on, or a broader interpretation of those provisions, all right? So really where this decision is being made is in the beginning of the risk assessment. It is this scoping and contextualizing exercise that will tell you what kind of adverse effects am I even looking into 
and which kinds of adverse effects will I ad eliminate right from the start? Hence, I will not get data on. Okay, so this is very important because it gives you the limits of your risk assessment and the limits of the scope and the depth of your, of your risk assessment that you get later. In the EU framework, this is where that step happens. It's a very important step. This is the critical step because it will set your limits and the depth of this. All right? That's why I will spend a little time on this because it will go through and you will see how the two narratives of broad and narrow will diverge based on what you do at this step. Here you decide what stressors do you include. All right, we'll come to that. You decide what kinds of adverse effects am I even going to consider and what kinds am I not considering. What types of exposure pathways will I look into which ones will I not look into? And how will I be doing the testing then based on these kinds of decisions? All right. So the first step will give you the quality and the quantity of the entire risk assessment. What you miss here will not come in later on anymore. That's why it's so important. And here it starts with a controversy right here already, although we agree that we should have a scoping step. The narrow interpretation basically relies and is almost restricted to what you know already about your compound and about your plant, the GMO, and what you put into it. And it is restricted basically to the intended use, and it goes along the intended effect. Now, a broader examination of the issues will go beyond the known and will look into unknown and unintended effects. This is where biosafety consideration begins. It builds on the knowledge you have for the knowns, but you're trying to get to understand what could be the unintended side effects of it. This is like what we do in medicine as well. You all know unintended side effects from your medication and all of that. So this is, it's in essence, the same philosophy. You're trying to understand what else, other than the intended effect, could happen unwantedly, and is there any way that we can anticipate this and do something about it? This is an industry interpretation of this step, for example, so that you know that I'm not making this up, but that this is in, in writing out there. Um, this is by Tom Nixon, he's from Monsanto Company in St. Louis. He published this paper in 2008, and he formulated that in early in risk assessment process, it is built on a hypothesis that are answered with the available information. And if you're from the available information and the known properties of a stressor, you can conclude that toxicity or exposure will be minimal and the stressor has no known toxicity, there is no reason to expect, and you don't understand or even can anticipate a mechanism, there's no reason to expect any adverse effect and no need for additional experiments, all right? This, so this is, this is the view, you, you know, within that view, this is logic, okay? This is a coherent thinking, if that's what you want. But the question is, is that the kind of thinking that we as a public want? And does that serve our public needs? It, ne it meets the needs of the industries, but does it meet our needs? And that's why it is important that people understand this, you know? So this is what he says, that's how pr problem formulation, the scoping and contextualizing of that risk assessment should be done. And you can imagine that the, you know, that scope will come out much narrower than a scope that we sort of foresee from a public. And it goes on, okay? So I try to give you the two, the different narratives so you understand where the people and the different philosophies come from so you can decide for yourself which one is the one that you want to have and see and being uh, see followed in regulations as well. This does affect what kind of data you will get and what kinds of effects you look into and what kinds of exposures you look into, all right? And I give you some examples. So, for example, if you look into herbicide-resistant plants, the, most of them are based on glyphosate, and the way these plants, Gillerick has uh, explained this already a bit earlier, and I think Michael touched on this as well. The way they are produced is they have a substitute enzyme being transferred into them, 
the original enzyme, any, an enzyme in, a, in, an, in an important metabolic pathway, in an amino acid pathway, is blocked by glyphosate so that a resistant plant can continue doing that important metabolic, uh, metabolic pathway, you need a substitute enzyme that continues it. And that substitute enzyme, or the gene coding for it, was taken out of a microbe and put into a plant. And that ensures that that metabolic pathway continues to function in a plant, even though you get a shower of glyphosate on it, all right? But and that may be and is part of the story that Michael and others were alluding to. That's the reason why we see also yield drag, because obviously that microbial enzyme isn't quite as optimal in its performance as the plant-owned one, because the plant-owned one is blocked by glyphosate, okay? It's just taken over then by the parallel system that's being introduced in a plant. And all of that is, of course, the machinery of a plant and the machinery of a microbe are different and are different, differently optimized for their uh, genetic and environmental context uh, in evolutionary time periods, all right? So that's one reason behind that phenomenon of yield drag, is that that substitute enzyme isn't quite as efficient as the plant-owned one is, no surprise. Now, but this is not where I want to get at. Where I want to get at is the benefit, all right? Why farmers grow this plant, why they buy it and why they do it, the benefit of it is, comes through a systemic effect. The GMO by itself doesn't do anything, basically, and the farmer is not buying it to just grow that GMO. He's buying it because he will and can then spray Roundup on it, all right? So these two things are married, if you wish. It's an integrated package sold and promoted on that ground saying, you can now spray glyphosate on it, and glyphosate is being considered a more benign, a less malign, I usually call it, less malign herbicide than many others. This was the promotion at the beginning, <coughs> saying glyphosate is less dangerous than atrazine or 2,4-D and, and paraquat and some of the other stuff out there, all right, which may even be true. Ah, so the benefit comes through the application of a broad-spectrum herbicide. This is why the farmers can, can grow it, and this is on the, on the benefit side. It's put a less malign herbicide can be used. Therefore, we have an environmental benefit. We, have, we can resort to less or low-till um, production practices. This is an environmental benefit against soil erosion and so on. Now, the impact also comes, obviously, through the application of a broad spectrum herbicide is also the result of a systemic effect, all right? As the term broad spectrum herbicide says, you're killing a whole lot of weeds out there that are not a problem. Usually it's a handful or maybe a dozen of plants in, in any agroecosystem agro that causes or reaches levels that are noxious and that actually require control because it's outcompeting your crop plant. But all other plants, and there's plenty of them, uh, are not a problem, but they're all wiped out with this, okay? So these are non-target effects. These are non-target plants, and their associated fauna is taken out, all right? So that concern, but under the narrow interpretation, the effect for the impact assessment of the herbicide is excluded, all right? They only look at the novel trait in form of that this substitute enzyme is being introduced, and all effects that could arise through the application of a broad-spectrum herbicide are excluded because it is separated. For the impact and risk assessment, you separate the plant from a GMO and its corresponding chemical. For the benefit side, you put it together. But for the risk side, it's being separated and treated separately. All right? So that's one inconsistency that we, we find. In a broader assessment, you would, of course, include the stressor herbicide in it. And you would include also the effects that a herbicide sprayed plant would cause in terms of human health, which we heard a lot before, because you're increasing your herbicide uh, residue level in your food and feed for animals and human consumption. And of course, this has an environmental impact as well, because you're spreading that glyphosate in those plants. It's a systemic pesticide, uh, herbicide. It's taken up by the plant. It is accumulated in its, in its beans and plant tissues. So it's out there. All right. Now, where did it get us? Meaning that basically all of these risks, adverse effects on biodiversity of non-target flora and associated fauna, and 
the resistance that could occur if you repeatedly and only spray glyphosate is all excluded under the narrow interpretation, which is actually the current one that regulators accept, uh, is all excluded from the risk assessment. Okay? You will not see that in any of the dossiers submitted to the regulator for approval. Now, we find that is, uh, that's a double standard right there. Where did it get us? Okay, let's look into this. The biodiversity in agroecosystems I was alluding to in many of our agroecosystems remains in structures that are either integral to the, to the agroecosystem or very closely connected to it, all right? It is, it is remnants of vegetation, it is field margins, it is hedges and streams, aquatic streams, and so on, where you have the rest of the biodiversity in a large-scale agro, agricultural landscape prevails in Europe and prevails in many other countries. All right, so this has concerned actually the British in the late 90s, early 2000s. They said, well, wait a minute, you know, we have already a huge problem. England really has a huge problem. They've sort of eliminated all of their forests and for them really the biodiversity is in hedges and walls, the stone walls and so on. And they have seen a huge decline in land birds, farmland birds, and that kind of stuff because of that decline of the food bases to sustain uh, bird populations in their environment. So the British government put out hundreds of millions of pounds for the biggest test, farm scale evaluations, they called them, where they actually looked into whether or not GM or HR crop production with broad spectrum herbicides would add on and above conventional herbicide treatment in conventional farming, which has already caused a lot of problems, whether there's any additional effect beyond and above that to be expected. And they did a huge study. I really cannot go into this here, but I, I, I recommend you reading it. They looked at 60 farms all over England <clears throat> and used three different herbicide-tolerant uh, crop types, oilseed rape, maize, and sugar beet, and looked at, at weeds, at, at plants growing in there, and some of sorry, some of their associated invertebrate fauna, bees, butterflies, seed feeding carabids, and so on. And the outcome after three years in a huge, huge database, the biggest there is so far, of a three-year experiment came out that, yes, for oilseed rape and uh, for beet, there was a lower diversity in abundance of weeds and also of associated invertebrates in there. So obviously, if their food plants weren't there, those associated food feeders on those plants weren't there either, right? Except for maize. In maize, they didn't find this effect. It was equal, basically, but it was criticized, and that was really not very clever, because they used atrazine as a comparison, and atrazine is being banned, and it was already on the list. We knew already it would be banned by the end of this, of this trial, so one really wonders why they used a, a herbicide as a comparator that was on its way out. All right. However, it came, the Acre com Committee came to the conclusion that further consequences on higher trophic levels, like farmland birds, skylark being a really important one, are likely. We don't need to test whether the birds are dead and, and disappear. We know that if their food basis is gone, they will likely be gone too. And so they recommended that HR... Um, oilseed rape and sugar beet shouldn't be, shouldn't be grown in Great Britain, but based on the data that was delivered, you know, in consideration with atrazine, they said for HR maize, that doesn't seem to be the case, and so you could go forward with uh, approving maize on those grounds. All right. Now let's look at the weed resistance that never was looked into, never was part of any risk assessment or conditional release, quite in contrast to BT plants, where I will come in a moment. When they were introduced in 1996, there was basically no known resistance to glyphosate in plants. And I remember, because I've, I'm in this field way before, that people were laughed at who said, well, if you start spraying glyphosate all of the time now, you might start seeing resistance. And I still know people, personally, who got up in meetings like this and would say this is BS. If there could be resistance against glyphosate, it would be there now because it's being used for a while, all right? Roundup has been used for quite a while. It's been approved as a broad-spectrum herbicide for all kinds of uses, but certainly not on a crop because it would kill the crop. It was used pre before crops were grown. You had to wait until the compound was degraded to a degree that you actually could grow your crop in there without hurting it. 
Now, interestingly, with the introduction, basically already shortly thereafter, we started seeing resistance popping up, resistant weeds, all right? And as you can see now, we're now way up here, and resistance, weed resistance, has become a huge problem, meanwhile, in the big production countries. And there is actually now scientists in the US coming forward really with alarming reports as, as, as strong and clear as we will not be able to grow soybean anymore if we don't find a solution to this. And it has hit the same thing in Argentina, and it's beginning also to become a real problem in Brazil. Now, it's gotten to the point where Monsanto now has been, you know, coming out, and now all of a sudden you see people in the field say, yeah, well, we, of course, this had to happen, that, yes, if you use one compound all the time, you will have resistance, that's normal, and it's a stupid farmer who, grow, who sprays all the time glyphosate, well, no wonder he will have resistance. So he has to, of course, use different types of herb herbicides now. And now Monsanto has on its website recommendations of tank mixes and of all kinds, and resorting back to 2,4-D, resorting back to those herbicides that they were promoting their products earlier as being a benefit to get away from. All right, so we're, we're doing a bit of a circle coming back. And just for illustration, these are some data. You find lots of information on that. This is where, where it's been spreading in the US, and that's, already, that's not updated. That's like a year or two ago. And this is, this is a field, some photos I have from colleagues from Argentina. Um, this is not a cornfield, if you might want to think. This is so Sorghum halapense, the Johnson grass. It's one of the worst weeds on, on this planet. And uh, this is what they were trying to grow here. This is, this is soybean, okay? They're, they won't harvest anything there, that's clear. And the same here, this is all Johnson grass. The, the soybean you don't even see anymore. And these are all resistant to glyphosate, that's why it didn't work. So you can spray, so for a while they started increasing the concentration, then they increased uh, um, the frequency, and it's, it's not working for, for the really resistant one, it's not working anymore. All right, so there is a disaster in the making. People are sort of feeling it, that it's coming, and they're trying desperately now through recommendations like tank mixes and using other herbicides to deal with it. But, you know, we have to see. That's an ongoing thing. Moving on to BT. BT is a completely different story, all right? The plant expresses itself a toxin here. It's a potent insecticidal toxin, all right? So that's different. Herbicide plants, you add a toxin, you add a pesticide, but here the plant itself is tox insecticidal, all right? It has the, the insecticide incorporated, and it has it in all plant parts during all of the time of the year, and in basically all tissues except fluids. We couldn't find it in phloem and xylem. And it is there, supposedly, in high concentrations. And that is even required because for these plants, we do have resistant management plants. That's the only issue that even the EPA ever was willing to take up due to the pressure of some of very dedicated colleagues of mine in the US who really pushed hard and said, if you put these plants out there, you will have resistance in no time and that technology will be lost. All right, so the EPA ag agreed to this and there is clear resistance management refuge and, and high dose part is, is a condition for growing this. So you have to follow certain rules. We didn't see that for, for herbicide resistant plants, which was a mistake. But again, what you see here when it comes to the, to the uh, risk assessment, you see again under narrow interpretation, you see a separation of the plant, which is being submitted to the substantial equivalence testing that you've heard before, is therefore considered safe because we're eating maize since thousands of years. So we have a, sa a record of safe, uh, a safe history. And what we look at is only the added protein as a linear addition, plant plus protein, plant safe, protein is looked into. And the protein is looked into as a chemical, all right? It follows very strictly the OECD guidelines for acute tox testing, ecotox testing of pesticides, of chemicals. So short-term acute tox tests are being done with a handful of, of species. None of it is looked into either interactions with the plant, cumulative effects, synergistic effects, any of that. None of that is looked into. Argument is, if you don't see anything here, none of that will happen. All right? Now, under a broader uh, interpretation, of course, you would look at the plant. That's what the regulation says, too. It says GMO. Now, do you, is, it, is it sufficient to test something as a chemical when you're supposed to test an organism?
nobody could sort of answer that question whenever I pose it. They're like, oh, we don't know, you know, we have to see legally, you know, whether that is actually uh, the case. So this is what's being done for BT plants for ecotox testing, just the insects. It's not, not the health testing, okay? You, st you test standard surrogate species. Those are species that are genetically uniform usually, and that, that don't exist really in nature. They're lab insects and lab, lab organisms. So you can do testing. They're not necessarily in the receiving environment. You conduct an acute tox test, never with a thousand. For chemical testing, you go for safety factors, you go up to a thousand in order to make sure there may be you know, something you overlook. And if you don't see something at a thousand fold of the environmental expected exposure, you feel pretty safe that nothing will happen. We at best see in those trials a factor of two or five, but never a hundred or a thousand. And we only use the microbially produced toxin. All right? It's never the toxin that as it is expressed in the plant. And the Bt toxin in the plant is quite different from what a microbe produces, all right? Thank you. So, in effect, what you do for testing right now is it treats a plant as a chemical. It's tested as a chemical, which we find is insufficient and not scientifically sound. All right, I skipped this. Well, it's also not looked into because you only have a narrow assessment. You don't see anything, therefore you don't need to look into the wider issues, is what happens when these BT-containing tissues, that's, it's everywhere, it's in the roots, in the roots, root exudates, it's in the pollen, it's in the silk, it's in the pith, it's in all tissues, all right? That's being spread and circulated, it goes into the soil, it, it degrades or, you know, it leaches out as a pure toxin or it degrades with the plant material. We've done tests, we can find the BT all the time until the plant material is gone and so on. It's being fed to animals. Anyway, none of this is considered. All right, in the risk assessment as it is currently done under the narrow paradigm. So where did it get us? Well, we have overlooked that animals pick it up and they do something to it. And we see a, this is like the big, the large protein. If it goes into a cow intestine, they've done tests. It's being degraded to like a 35 kDa, a 17 kDa. And what is coming out in the manure is a 17 kDa piece of the full toxin. Well, they have never run any tox tests on this. We don't know whether this is still bioactive. We just know the molecular weight of it. But the BT molecule is really, the, the tricky part of it is it works only as a fragment. I can't go into the mode of action, but as the, the toxin degrades, it shifts its uh, sensitivity and its spectrum. We've seen that, that can happen. None of, nobody looked ever into whether that is still active. Um, we know that it's spreading, that everything that is feeding on those plants, you believe it or not, that's been denied. When I started uh, trying to raise these issues uh, early on, it's been denied that this could happen. People really, and you see this in the dossier, they were putting forward, say, oh, that stuff is not going to last for more than two days, so it's not going to affect any, any, any other insect. Well, now, 10 years later, you know, 10 years after the first production, basically, the first data came out that actually just looked into that exposure side, what kinds of organisms are picking it up, can we see it in higher trophic levels, like all the way up to spiders, which is well, fairly high on the trophic level, it's everywhere, of course. You know, you find it, and you can find it even in fairly high concentrations, which is surprising, we don't know why that is. All right, so this is where we stand right now. We find it in predatory organisms. We find it in spiders. Definitely, we find it in everything that feeds directly on the plant. So it's there, all right? So everything that's feeding in the food chain will take up some portion of Bt toxin, except we don't know what it's doing there. So what can happen is if you have a field that is expressing uh, an insecticide constantly, it's a very persistent pesticide, if you wish, you will see shifts in the herbivore population. Those that are affected will go away, open up niches, that's basic ecology, and those niches will be settled by others. We know this phenomenon very well. It's called secondary pest development or pest replacement. All right. So if you had to be decided, if you were to look into these things, this is basic ecology. That's not rocket science. You know these things. All right. And you could start anticipating which ones could be the ones who move in. All right. Some people were starting to do this, and best studies are from China because they can work a bit more with more degrees of freedom than we can. And they were anticipating already in 2002, they were saying mirrors, heteropterans, very far away from the target organisms, 
um, have become key pests in transgenic cotton fields and that damage to cotton could increase further with the expansion of the area planted. Remember, 2002, they were saying this already. And we started seeing that in the US as well. 2010, they said, well, merit bugs have progressively increased. Well, nobody was doing anything, of course. And now they've acquired a pest status in cotton and multiple other crops in association with a regional increase in Bt cotton. And now they're spraying more pesticides against those other pests than they sprayed in previous days against the original pest that they eliminated. Same thing with the leaf hoppers and so on. It happened also in the US, but in the US you cannot do free research anymore because the companies control what you do. So what you have to do there is basically go into the farm press, which we do on a regular basis. And so you can see in farmers' magazines and stuff when they give out advice, insect pressure has shifted, modified cotton curbs one pest only to unleash another, and emerging new pest of Bt maize, the western bean cutworm, we didn't know that this existed before that, came specifically on Bt maize, and so on. So and resistance is emerging. Despite the resistant management plans that have to be installed, we are now starting to see May, uh, resistance, South Africa, India, it's confirmed. These are all confirmed cases by Monsanto here in the US as well. And this year was a publication. We had corn rootworm um, resistant, uh, a new type of BT maize out there for a couple years, for a few years, not much, a CRI 3 based. And already within a few years, we were seeing resistance there, despite resistant management programs. I skipped, this is South Africa case where I'm involved a bit myself. This is the area where they grow industrial maize. And this was a picture I took. This is BT maize, Mon A10, being sprayed with endosulfane. You know, endosulfane is a banned substance now. It's going to be banned very soon here. And it's this payment, uh, is uh, the, the spray is paid by Monsanto. And we were out there with Monsanto people, and they were proud to tell and show us that we're paying this. Uh, otherwise, the farmers wouldn't be buying this anymore, obviously. So this was 2010, January, in Falhad region in South Africa. All right. Well, when it comes now to the stacked ones, this is really where that whole philosophy becomes very, very tricky. Because if you follow that narrow interpretation, and you assume that if you put these two together in an additive fashion, and you've approved either one already being safe, you don't need to test them anymore, okay? And that's what's happening. You don't get data on those combined stacked plants. But here you have now herbicide sprayed plants with at least one, two, three, four, up to six Bt toxins combined in one plant. No tests performed because we didn't see one when we admitted them as a single gene parent, based on those crude tests that I was just saying. All right, this is the smart stacks, six Bt toxins, two herbicides now, because they hope that if they combine now glufosinate with glyphosate, it still might work. And this is what you'll find in terms of, um, we're looking into this now a bit more in detail, but this is what the best we can find on the, in the web, what's done on safety testing. The argument goes, it's not intended to change any nutritional aspect. Therefore, probably the plant will do what we tell it. And to confirm that, a confirmatory, this is not my wording, please keep in mind, a confirmatory feeding study in broiler chicken was done. I don't know what a confirmatory test is, really. I mean, if I would go out and say I make a confirmatory test, I'd be fired the next day, you know. No biologic relevant differences, the usual wording and the compositional properties relative to control and reference maize, which is what Michael Antonio said, everything under the sun that looks and smells like maize. Um, confirmed, so the confirmatory chicken trial confirmed that this maize is as safe and nutritious as conventional maize. That's science. I've published all of this for those who are interested. We have come up with a new model. I might run a few, few moments over time. We have come up with a new model because it's a bit a story on hope. And that new model uh, was funded by German, I'm not gonna go into the Swiss and the German uh, government organizations for funding it. We've been publishing it, it's been running since many years. And 
for non-target assessment, we were basing it on a biodiversity approach, on a functional approach. We were saying we don't need methods that prescribe what kinds of tests with what kind of organisms we have to do in order to tailor it to the receiving environment. We need to go into that environment and select the species in those cropping systems that are most likely going to be exposed to it and that possibly could exhibit an effect, all right? And so we came up with a very detailed selection procedure that is prescriptive for selection of these organisms, but then you design, based on what you've learned, how to test them. That project has been now, it's a stepwise procedure. I'm not going because it's getting close into it. It selects the species based on their functions, whether the functions are important. So it's usually pollinators, degraders, and, and herbivores, and predators, biocontrol organisms. Then you understand whether they are exposed or not. You do a careful exposure analysis, and then you say, how should we test these organisms based on their natural being exposed? We develop specific adverse effect scenarios and test them in those uh, practical testing. We've done this multiple times in four or five uh, case examples that were all published and all tried out. It works. Of course, it needs adjustment and can be improved and so on, but basically it works. And it has worked so good and it's been so convincing that it's being taken up now by EFSA. Surprise. So we were happy to see in their first draft for their revised environmental risk assessment guidelines, they took our original graph, as I just showed you from our publication. They changed then for copyright reasons and all kinds, they changed the graphics, but it is still the same one. And we get little referencing, so I, I don't know. I've been complaining with EFSA so, because the last thing I want, really, I'm glad that they pick it up, but I don't want them to sell it as their product now. You know, this is that would be a bit unfair. However, they are putting it, and you have heard already earlier, where they put this in their revised overall scheme of things. They put it here. All right. Where did it go? Yeah, it only flashes up. They put it here. This is a non-target organism assessment. However, what they do is, oh, my little circles have disappeared. Doesn't matter. They have added a comparative safety assessment before any of the risk assessment. And that comparative safety assessment is, again, a reintroduction of the substantial equivalence concept, which we foresee will filter out anything and only subject those that don't make it through that safety assessment before you go to a risk assessment. I mean, that logic is already mind-boggling to me. Um, hardly anything will ever get there. So that is our, our suspicion. We've been putting this forward loudly and noisily to the EU Commission that please exclude. They were saying, no, 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 this is not what we want. I said, well, then exclude it, all right? If that's not what you want, then put this comparative safety assessment somewhere else or make it very clear that this is not going to be the function. Right now, the way it is set up, that's one way we see it. And we will hold you accountable and responsible if that's how it happens, all right? So in essence, they've took it, taken up our concept, they've integrated it, but they put a little bottleneck before so that possibly nothing will ever end up there. All right, yes, I wrap up. I will not go into corporate control anymore. We can discuss this later on. I only wrap up with two slides, you know, saying that we do need counter expertise. We do need critical minds. The European Union and any society should be happy and glad and promote critical thinking and inquisitive work. They're not really doing it now, but we won't go away and we're not going away. We have founded now this, as Gilles Ebrick and others have pointed out, a international network of scientists for social and environmental responsibility. We will come back to your lovely country in May next year and host a conference on risks of public health and environment, a time for converging technology assessment. Not only the technologies are being converged, you've probably heard of nano, synbio, and genetic engineering now all converging into one. We need, as that converges, we need to converge that technology assessment as well. We will touch on that and we will bring in some of the people who are working with the people affected in South, Af uh, South America uh, with the glyphosate uh, effects on the human health uh, community, so the doctors from there will come, Carrasco will come, and a number of other people who are 
witnessing what's going on in Argentina. So I hope I see you there then. It'll be in Madrid next year in May again. That was my little contribution. Thank you.